Good morning and a very warm welcome to our annual general meeting. So my name is Satnam Rana. Uh, it's actually Satnam Rana Grindley. I did get married along the way. I mean, I'm used to when I'm standing on stage <laughs> using, um, using my maiden name. Um, Satnam Rana Grindley. I'm the Director of Communications, Marketing and External Affairs here at GBS LEP. Uh, we really hope you've enjoyed um, networking over breakfast and your pastries and teas and coffees, which are available, by the way, all day. Um, and we will be having lunch a little later on together as well. If you are staying on for our Better Your Business show, that gets underway at 10 a.m. this morning, and we have a number of masterclasses which are taking place this morning and this afternoon. You're very welcome to stay on. I know quite a few businesses in the room have signed up for that as well, but if you haven't, don't feel that you need to leave at 10 o'clock. You can stay on. Just let us know. Um, a bit of housekeeping first. You've probably figured it out if you've had to empty your bladder this morning, but um, the toilets are mixed occupancy. There are some single occupancy toilets, um, should you wish to use them, at the front of the reception desk. And there are accessible toilets as well, available on every floor in this great building, which we'll hear about in a moment. We're not expecting a fire alarm, so if there is a fire alarm, and it has happened at many events where I've hosted, um, then please do exit via the, the, the fire exits, one at the back of the room there and several around the building. Meet at the front of the building um, or just around the corner by the Eagle and Ball pub, which unfortunately won't be open until after 11 o'clock, so we'll just be meeting there, not having <laughs> drinks. Um, we have got a hashtag today, so if you are using social media, then please, please, please do share your thoughts your pictures, selfies, and use the hashtag BYB2022. Also, we're filming this AGM. It will be available on our website in the coming days, and we are filming throughout the day as well, and expecting the BBC to be here, because it's not just GBS LEP's AGM day, it's also, of course, Autumn Statement Day, and um, they're doing a piece from here. So do watch out um, for coverage on BBC Midlands today at 630 this evening and maybe at 1.30 as well, a shortened version. So let's get started then with our AGM. GBS SLEP has been going for over 11 years and we have been driving towards inclusive and sustainable economic growth through, through the creation of jobs and through investment across the region. And to find out a little bit more about the work we do and the impact we've made over the last year, we have a small bite-sized film for you. Absolute godsend. You can get grants, um, every bit of help possible. The Peer Network Group has been amazing. So the idea today is working with BNP Paribas and students from Solihull College to tackle a business challenge set by BNP Paribas uh, and as part of that we're going to be building skills, social communication skills, collaboration skills, creativity uh, and helping BNP Paribas get an insight into the thoughts and ideas from young people. The growth have been great, they've always pointed me in the right direction, they've supported with things like IP, um, just having someone there on hand to kind of ask questions to if I need to, they've been great. It's so good going through Super Tech to build the MVP um, using no code because that has sort of accelerated our go to market time. Some of the work we do and the difference it does make to individuals and businesses um, across the region. It's about creating better places for all of us to live and to work in. And we serve uh, nine local authority areas, and this is my exam question. They are Wire Forest, Bromsgrove, Redditch, Cannock Chase, Tamworth, Lichfield, East Staffordshire, Birmingham, and Soley Hull. 
Now, historically, we've been the custodian of capital funds from central government, and you've seen in that video some of our major investments, including Paradise. We saw the city come alive this year with the Commonwealth Games, and we were really proud of the input we've had in some of those key civic squares, which really did instill a massive civic pride in all of our people who are visiting the region, and of course, our businesses who are benefiting from the footfall as well. And this building is also brand new, open just just a few months ago, Steam House, powered by Birmingham City University and has very much been part of our strategic plan as well and our capital investments. And to tell us a little bit more about the building, please welcome onto the stage Joe Birch, who is the Director for Innovation, Enterprise and Employability at BCU. Joe. Here at BCU, we're passionate about our communities. Many of our students come from those communities, and so enabling them, skilling them up, preparing them for work is really critical. As employers and as stakeholders in this region, we're keen to work with you in order that we can stimulate and navigate and encourage our students to be work ready. When we decided to develop Steam House, we went on a journey with a, a, a number of stakeholders, including the chair at the moment, Anita Bala, through the Creative City Partnership. Through research that she commissioned, we identified that the innovative capacity of this region wasn't where it needed to be. And one of the reasons for that is that we weren't colliding and ideating and enabling people to get from a concept into completion as quickly as possible. And for those of you who are going through that process, you'll know it's incredibly expensive. And if you fail fast, it means you're more likely to succeed in the end. Here at BCU, we've invested £72 million, and we would not have been able to do that without the GB SLEP. Not only have they provided us with the funding guidance, the chair, Anita Bala, has been one of the most amazing champions of this project in helping us get it off the ground. In Steam House, there's 110,000 square feet, hopefully, of secret ingredients that will inspire you to think about what problems actually exist. We know from research that many people don't frame problems correctly and as a result build new services and products incorrectly so that when they go to market, customers don't actually want the end result. We know as Steamhouse we're part of a really important community and we're located in the knowledge quarter and I would like to play tribute to the other elements of that knowledge quarter including Bruntwood SciTech, Aston University and BMET, many representatives are here today. I do believe that by collaborating together we'll achieve much more. Our region needs us to innovate in order to address many of the societal challenges that we have. Steamhouse looks to, to resolve those challenges by taking arts, creativity, design-led thinking and STEM, combining them together by bringing communities and conversation and encouraging collaboration by providing a challenge lab, a production space, a skill suite, an in incubator, an accelerator, a digital STEAM innovation hub that specialises in immersive AR and VR technologies, along with new degree programmes and new skill suites for executive education to power us forward. I would urge you all, uh, there's lots of people here from the BCU team, to, to discover your own journey, because we know that every journey is individual, but we think through collaboration and working together, amazing things can happen. We're really excited that you've come to BCU and to Steamhouse today, and on behalf of Professor Philip Plowden and the BCU team, we hope you have a fantastic day. Joe, thank you very much. I know when I came to the opening here, I brought my 10-year-old son and I had to drag him away. Um, we are opening up those workspaces at lunchtime, so over lunch, if you do want to wander into them and speak to some of those makers, then please do so, because that's what this building is about, interacting with each other, networking, and as Joe said, connecting. Thank you for having us here and hosting our AGM and Better Your Business show here. So... Our AGM is about looking forwards and looking back as well at the achievements and the impact we've made over the last year and indeed for over a decade in the region. We are at a time where many of us are challenged by the rapidly changing social, 
political and economic um, environment. And of course today, as I said earlier on, is a big day. It's Autumn Statement Day. So lots of changes on the way, but we do know that our businesses have one thing up their sleeve, and that is resilience. They showed resilience during COVID, they showed resilience during that EU exit and beyond, and undoubtedly they will dig deep and show resilience over the next 18 months or so as well. To expand on what we do and where we're heading, I'd like to invite onto the stage now our interim chair, Anita Bala. Thanks, Satna. Thank you, Satna. Thanks, Joe. Um, Joe, it was a partnership, really was. We had so many amazing people um, joining us in that. I stood here a year ago and said I would take on the role to be um, interim chair for three months. I'm still standing here because we hadn't quite appreciated um, what was going to happen on the political landscape and, and some of the changes the government were going to bring uh, around to the left. But I want to begin by just thanking all of you because I know there are many, many businesses here who've been on that amazing 11-year journey with us. So thank you for that and, and um, stay with us because we're not going anywhere just yet and I'll explain why. Um, as this is an AGM, I do have to take you through some, some statistics, etc. But going back to the key, the success of, of uh, our LEP, I think it's because we've managed to bring education, businesses um, and politicians together and small and large businesses. Um, and the academics have been also very important, higher education, further education. And I think that's given us an amazing opportunity to have dialogues and partnerships that wouldn't exist without those conversations. And also we have an apolitical approach which has also enabled us to drive the conditions for growth. Um, this has been through investing in big infrastructure projects, support for business and creating jobs and skills training opportunities through our partnership work. I keep on hearing this word partnership, but it really is so important because partnerships are fundamental to our success. And I'll just talk you through some of the investments um, that, have gone, that have taken place over the last few years because of these partnerships. Since 2010, we've been awarded £823 million of investment from the government for the region, and we're on course to secure more than £820 million of additional investment towards projects from the public and private sector. And add in our enterprise zone investment and revenue projects, and we forecast something in the region of £1.8 billion will have been invested into our regional economy by 2045. That's quite impressive. And then for every one pound invested, we've generated three pounds in public-private investment. So we make, really do make our, our, pub, our public funding go a lot further. We've also crea been creative with our funding and we've reinvested recycled money um, into key strategic projects. Again, a very key way of working. Since 2010, our work has added an additional 187,000 jobs into the regional economy and our work has helped increase GVA by 12.7 billion. And of course, as Satnam and others have mentioned, the last few years have been harder than any of us would have predicted. And I think it's going to stay that way because we know of the turbulent situation we find ourselves in. Throughout these turbulent times, our LEP has remained committed to helping our communities to build their resilience. LEPs were designed to deliver, and I think that's what we've done. And we've done that, again, in partnership, in collaboration with all the partners around us. Now, that said, our LEP, along with the 38 other LEPs across the UK, have been asked to integrate into local democratically elected bodies by the government. For us, that means that some of our services will transfer to the West Midlands Combined Authority in the next financial year. The government has decided the Combined Authority will take on the accountability for the business support offered in the region that's currently done through our work, through our growth hubs. We're in the process of working out how this will look like and we're working very hard to make sure that our businesses don't lose out during this process. Our overarching and undisputed aim is to create a smooth transition. We don't want to get in the way of, of this happening, so they want to make sure businesses carry on having that very vital support. And while this work is continuing, we recognise the need for our businesses to continue to have all the access they need. So today, I want to assure you that we'll continue supporting you through the Growth Hub until December 23. This gives us time to transition our services to their new homes 
and provide continuity of support that's essential at this time of political and social and certainly economic uncertainty. This year, we've also continued to support skills and workplace through our skills service offered by our Growth Hub. We've funded initiatives by our, uh, we've, we've also funded initiatives to help local people, particularly young people, to get back into the workplace. And we've also supported employers to identify opportunities to upskill their existing workforce. Once again, we remain committed to this work till December 23, when our European funding will run out. Placemaking has also been an important aspect of our work. We manage the Enterprise Zone for Birmingham City Council. We have got 39 sites across the city centre with significant growth opportunities. This programme has been uh, given us an opportunity to create 40,000, or potential to create 40,000 new jobs and 2 billion of investment to the economy to make it available 1.3 million square metres of additional commercial floor space. You've seen some of that in Paradise, for example. In Paradise, it's attracting over 700 million pounds of private sector investment, um, and that's going into that high quality space. And if you've been there, you can see how amazing that is. And we've got big names like PwC, Arab, Goldsmith, already committed to that space. And then along from Paradise, we've got Centenary Square, another example of our investment. 10 million was invested to regenerate that square. Um, and that was followed by six, six million into Symphony Hall and the new B Music spaces, and 1.4 million into the, the public and private commercial spaces for, for the rep. This investment was showcased so well during the Commonwealth Games, and that sense of pride and all our initiatives show that the sense of pride is important for citizens. It's not just about businesses and, and buildings, it's about giving people a real sense of pride while we're provi providing ec that economic growth. And then, what about Digbeth? So if you walk along Digbeth, not very far from here, change is afoot there too. Once again, our gap funding that we invested into the Creative Content Hub has been followed by the BBC announcing that they're moving into the Typhoon Factory, which is going to look quite amazing, I'm sure. Uh, Steve Knight of Peaky Blinders fame is building his studio there, and of course, that's the area where MasterChef will be relocating nearby. So in, in addition to this, Enterprise Zone money is enhancing the public space around the Metro extension, as well as the Curzon Street station, where HS2 will come into the city centre. People started to call that our creative quarter, but um, I don't want to get into that argument. There may be other creative quarters across the city. So all our enterprise zone work and legacy capital projects will transfer to Birmingham City Council, and I see, uh, I think I saw Councillor Bird here uh, earlier on. Um, and so this is a real commitment to everyone to build upon those successes. So the future, of course, is going to look very different from what it's been like over the last few years. But we are here today to let you know that as an organisation, our LEP will continue to supply support and businesses until December 23. I keep on getting that message across because we're not going anywhere anytime soon. Whilst we work very constructively to ensure a new model of delivery is worked out. We believe the next year gives us time to ensure our services are transferred or integrated. And this has come about we've got, because we've kept financial money robust. We've got a robust amount of money and our, our financial position is good. Finally, the GBS LEP is driven by a passion for serving our communities and dedicating our passion um, and driving our passion into making sure real change happens. Well, you've seen some of the change that's happened here in the last 11 years in this city and region to make this city and region a fantastic place to work in and to play in because it isn't all about work. And it wouldn't have happened without our partners, without many of you here. And I have to pay tribute to the staff team who over the last year, at a very, very difficult time, have held it all together. They've given more than 100% of their time and commitment, and to our board, many of them sitting here, because without their time and dedication, this wouldn't have happened. We couldn't have kept ourselves onto the straight and narrow and make sure that the future is going to look good for this city and region. Thank you. Anita, thank you very much. So just to reiterate, 
We are going to continue our business support until December 23. We want to make that really clear to everybody today, and it's a really important message that we'd like you to share with others as well. And the reason for that is that we really do truly believe that there needs to be a continuity of service at a critical time for when we find ourselves at a critical time when it comes to our economy and obviously social and political changes as well. So December 23, that's the key date. Um, but what does our business support actually look like? How is it delivered? How does it land? And what does it feel like? Important questions, which I think only businesses themselves can really answer, which is why we've invited this morning, I'm really delighted, um, from Green Sisters, which is a plant-based Indian manufacturing, uh, food manufacturing business based here in Birmingham. We've invited Geeta Sanhan along, who's a co-founder. She is one of our businesses that's had 12 plus hours of support from the Growth Hub. So please put your hands together for Geeta. She's come minus some motion. <laughs> Thank you, Satnam. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope you've uh, been suitably refreshed. And if you'd like to be more refreshed, um, some of the services that the LEP has actually been able to help provide me with is the ability to be able to open up a deli, which is just opposite where the Commonwealth Games actually appeared. So you're very welcome to come and um, see me and have a China samosa with me there. <laughs> um, so thank you for the great introduction. And I think all of the talks this morning were so key because they highlight something really important that really drove our business forward when we very started in 2016. And I think one of the very early conversations I had actually very much starting was with, um, at the time, Sandra at the LEP, who sat me down and talked to me about how I can actually penetrate the Birmingham landscape with an initiative um, which Green Sisters uh, is all about, and that's bringing the joy of food to everybody. Um, and, and the whole purpose of our business has been to ensure that we can help inclusivity, but from a food and inclusion perspective. Um, so our mission is to create safe and nourishing food that really gives people confidence, nutrition and choice, irrespective of if they're following a plant-based diet, a gluten, dairy, wheat or allergen-free diet. Um, and so in order to bring that passion to life um, and to sort of create the confidence around eating out occasions for everybody, we needed some guidance and we came to the LEP to initially start those discussions. Now, my, um, I suppose our mainstay products started out as being samosas and bhajis, so um, I, I know I've joked about it before, but you know, some of these products are really well missed by communities who can't actually eat food inclusively together. And for me, I wanted to point out a roadmap, really, of how the LEP has, at various points in our journey, um, really come, come to life and helped us along that path from 2016 in inception, where we initially had an idea to remove three allergens from our food to completely removing all 14 of the allergens that are currently being regulated by the Food Standards Agency. Um, so it says that 2016, we sort of came and had a, a conversation with a company called Blue Orchid, which was an introduction and a referral from the LEP. What that enabled us to do is to look at our existing um, product range and offering and talk to consultants in food, which is an area I'm not, um, I don't have a background in. I actually worked, believe it or not, as a training manager in pharmaceutical industries, and I wasn't a pharmacist then either. So <laughs> it was really important to me to kind of go to the experts, and I needed some consultancy, some advice, and to know that the food we were producing was really actually going to nourish those individuals. As a result of that support, we've won various awards for our food because that food consultant enabled us to be able to access um, information about how to be food safe. We ourselves also access some um, finance to be able to um, accredit the unit we were working in in Chester at the time. Um, but we also then went on to really want to halo the fact that allergen-free food can also be delicious because there's this really negative connotation associated with excluding certain things means there's no flavour. Not true. Um, and then I suppose for, for a while, we then went out and collaborated, which I think, Joe, you've really hit an amazing um, you know, concept there, which I think is really key in this region, and we do it so well. 
we actually have so many universities in this region that um, I know there's people in the audience I've worked with, for, again, from inception. Kate sat, sat in, in the audience here as well, where Aston University helped to provide us with some services. It was all linked in via the LEP. We'd have conversations consistently with our LEP advisor to help us to understand what other um, resources were available in the region. Uh, I have actually worked with the Steam House in 2020 um, during COVID, which was one of the most toughest times to navigate around business um, in, in this region, but also across the UK when you know we had COVID come along and we were trying to build a more sustainable and better greener um, UK. And um, we're talking about sustainability challenges, but we also know we're coming out of, um, we're coming into Brexit and who knows where the money's coming from after December 2023, but, you know, while it's here, we really um, wanted to continue to, to support our business through those great conversations. So um, I don't run the business uh, Green Sisters myself. I also have a co-founder, Arena, my sister, and we spent the time during COVID... Um, looking at strategy, because one of the biggest things that happened during COVID is people were being excluded within our market space. And what that meant was that you go into a supermarket, you wouldn't just be able to pick up a product and put it back down like you normally would and read the label. You'd actually be eyeballed for touching things that you shouldn't be touching and why are you putting it back down and oh my God, you know. So we looked at innovation and part of that innovation was an iconic strip in packaging um, which shows exactly what those allergens are on the front of pack and that piece of work wouldn't have been possible if we didn't have that advice that was um, enabled and referred to us by the LEP. So really key parts of what we've been able to access including the recovery grant was spent on um, areas of our business that we knew were going to pave the way for innovation both within our business but also within the UK on the whole, recognising um, you know, key factors that were challenges and really pushing those forward to make sure that we plugged those gaps that made our products relevant for the majority. Um, I've put the business recovery grant there but we also um, talked to the LEP about um, enabling us to have other parts of the community which we could help support as well. So it's not a one-way street, it's two ways. If, if you're helping us, we want to also help you. And part of that is employing people who didn't have the skills but wanted to come out of their shell and be able to be, um, you know, at the after COVID, lots of individuals who'd just come out of university didn't have employment opportunities because there just weren't as many jobs available. So again, we supported some of that infrastructure through conversations via um, the LEP. Um, and it, I've talked there about the diverse supply chains workshop. Now, the Commonwealth Games, rightfully, as Satnam has pointed out, has been an amazing part of the landscape now and, you know, the history of this region. We were so fortunate to have such an amazing um, number of events put on across the whole of the region. Um, and going on workshops like Div Diverse Supply Chain helped to access information that enabled us to know how to be a part of a process to be able to integrate into those supply chains. Not just the diverse supply chain, which was a series of workshops that the LEP actually put on, um, or gave the money funding towards, I should say, um, but also just further down, it talks about um, the food and drink, um, food and drink forum. It's about access to information and the ability to be able to connect. How can that information that you have and how can those programmes that are available within the LEP actually benefit your business? Because as a young entrepreneur who may not have started their mission or their innovation in an area that they have those experiences and skills, there needs to be somebody to hold your hand and help you through. Whether that person is in an area of work that's related directly to your industry really doesn't matter. It's about actually how can you be put into, in touch with individuals who may be able to open the doors to your next conversation that will help your business to flourish, that will mean you're still relevant and that will maintain your business um, you know, even in the tough times like COVID. So access to grants, I know I remember listening to the news and lots of individuals didn't have a clue as to how to get that funding that was being pumped into business. And I can let you know now that if you didn't have the LEP, 
I wouldn't have probably had uh, an idea of how to uh, and who to reach out to in order to be able to access some of those funds that were vital for us to continue um, and have enabled us to have so much success since then, including be able to open our first ever plant-based deli, which enables people to come in and eat together, which is a concept that I'm really passionate about, given that I've been excluded. And I know that there are a number of people who have got friends and family with allergies and intolerances that might be going to a buffet, not eating, and, and the silent person in the room, well, it's actually quite an excluding um, scenario and it's actually got quite a big mental health burden on those individuals. So doing the work that you do as a business, I'm sure there are many businesses in the room that have got vitally important resources. You can continue to talk to the LEP and they will point you out to the right sort of avenues that help you to access vital funds that keep you uh, afloat. So I'd really urge you to really consider, um, you know, talking to the LEP I am a, probably a serial um, person at accessing and connecting and collaborating and finding out what's available. So you can even see right the way down to May 2022, we're now in a position where we're looking for funding because we're looking to grow now as a business. As scary as that seems on a day like today when we have no idea about the stability, the energy costs, the cost of living crisis, et cetera, et cetera. There is so uh, many you know, avenues as to how you can look at alternative ways to give you that confidence. Resilience absolutely is the key, but you can't be resilient unless you actually hold those uh, keys to key conversations. And those are really enabled um, by, I think, things like um, the Greater Birmingham um, LEP. Now, I really wanted to just show you, obviously, an array of really delicious food that we are now able to produce at our deli called Planted by Green Sisters. But the point of this is, is this wouldn't have happened if I didn't have access to funding. The machinery that's in there, all the way up to the sign that you can see just at the top. I don't know if this laser actually works, it doesn't work. Um, that sign was part funded by a conversation I had on here with the Manufacturing Growth Programme, um, which obviously you've come out of COVID, you're not making as much on your margins. How are you going to afford those vital pieces of equipment? Um, and those vital pieces of equipment enabled us at Planted to be able to actually kit out the inside of the infrastructure and to be able to then have the Commonwealth Games on our doorstep where directly opposite the Commonwealth Games Alexander Stadium. People internationally saw us. We got free marketing for the local region. It was wonderful. But it wouldn't have happened without the support of the region and without those networks, conversations and the LEP. So I think, um, uh, you know, I haven't been bribed, I promise you, to give you all this information. Genuinely, this is true. Whatever your dreams are, whatever business path you're following, I really do encourage you to have really wide networks because it's a great region that we are all in and there is so much out there. If you just pick up the phone or just drop an email, somebody will definitely be there to help you to tell you how you can make your next steps. Just a quick one is that after today, I'm actually going to be going over and having a look at some new premises for our business, um, for our manufacturing part. The retail part of our arm was actually cut dead um, during COVID because we hadn't quite got there prior to um, the uh, COVID-19 um, scenario, which means that now we might be able to bring to life not only obviously having already got the premises, but some of those you know great packaging um, initiatives and strategic moves we made with that funding are now able to be able to potentially go into retail in the next 12 months. And none of that work would have happened if it wasn't for some of the conversations we had. So collaboration, reiteration of everything that was said, resilience, it's gonna be an interesting day today for all of us. Terrified about energy costs, terrified about what's to come, but delighted that we've still got the funding until 2023. Those conversations lean into them. I'm sure the LEP will be the first ones to know where the next lot of money is going to come from. And if you need the access to the finance, that's where we've got to go and have those conversations and also help support the rest of the community. If anybody wants to talk to me um, in the future, please feel free to reach out to me. My details are there. Um, but equally, I did say earlier, <laughs> a China samosa, absolutely, please do come down. But we've obviously got lots of other food. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Geeta, thank you so, so much. I met Geeta in 2020 and she was um, one of the first businesses we went out and profiled um, under the, the newly created role of, 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 he of then Head of Comms. Um, and it's just brilliant to see the business grow over the last couple of years because Back then, we actually filmed in a borrowed kitchen in a showroom in Sutton Coalfield, and to and you talked about your ambitions of opening up a premise here in in Birmingham. So it's great to see that even though we've had a turbulent um, couple of years, you have um, managed to expand your business and really uh, bring to light and to life uh, and to fruition your business ambitions. So thank you very much for sharing your journey with us, um, and and that's how we do it here at the LEP. So if you're a business, that's not not fully engaged with us or if you're engaged for three hours then up it to 12 hours and you could be on a similar journey to what Geeta and her sister has been on with Green Sisters. So next up um, I'm going to rattle through we're running a little bit late we have our chief executive who is going to speak a bit more about what we do what we've done and what we're going to do. Please welcome onto the stage Henriette Brukela. Yes, good morning, everybody. And how do I follow something as fantastic as, as your speech, Gita? Here we go. I'm, I'm going to try. You've already gathered that we operate at GBS Leper in quite a bit of uncertainty right now, and that makes me even prouder to say we have just had another really successful year of delivering and serving the businesses and communities we're here to support. Um, in, in this fantastic uh, city region, delivering a mission of inclusive and sustainable economic growth, creating jobs and improving the quality of life of everyone who lives and work, uh, works here. Over the last year, our growth hub uh, and, and many of the team of the growth hub are actually here today, have delivered almost 7,500 hours of dedicated business support to over 1,750 small and medium-sized businesses in the local area. And that support ranges from intellectual property protection to access to finance, from leadership programs to workshops, events, you name it. And of, and of course, Geet has talked you through that as well. And all of that is based on what businesses tell us they need. And we will deliver that focused business support right through to the end of December 23. Now, they do say if you want a message to land, you need to repeat it seven times. And I'm thinking, I think we're doing pretty well on that <laughs> this morning. Um, uh, and of course, it is really important that we continue to, to, to provide that business support, particularly because of all the economic turmoil that surrounds us. In fact, today in your pack, you will find a feedback form. And uh, in addition to asking your feedback on the event, we're also asking you to tell us what else we can do to help you. And it's really important you, you fill in that form and that we know what else we can do to help you because we do use that feedback to inform our actions. And we also use it to shape the future of business support in the region because we do work very closely with partners like the West Midlands Combined Authority, the local authorities, the West Midlands Growth, Growth Company to, to shape that future of business support in the region. This year, we launched our £1 million uh, Clean Grants programme. And that, again, was based on feedback from businesses on what could really help them cope with the rising energy prices we all face. Through this programme, local businesses can access a match-funded grant of up to £10,000 to help them invest in energy-saving measures. And uh, that could be uh, solar panels, that could be insulation, that could be programmable heating, that could be LED lighting, and so forth. Um, so far, we know that through this program, we will help generate over one and a quarter million pounds, uh, sorry, one and a quarter kilo, million kilowatt hours per annum saving. And that's a saving that equates to, for every thousand pounds of grant we award, a saving of over 6,000 kilowatt hours per annum, which in today's prices would cost about 2,000 pounds. So, of course, those savings continue year after year after year. So it's a really good example of um, making our money go really far and also a really good uh, illustration of our commitment to helping achieve a net zero economy through clean growth. Um, we um, also 
continue our support for the high growth sectors. And they're on the slide behind me. These high growth sectors and clusters were originally identified in the local industrial strategy for their potential to catalyze prosperity and employment in the region. And it's really encouraging that these sectors and clusters now also feature in the national and regional plan for growth. You see them here, they're creative and cultural industries, uh, data-driven health and life sciences, advanced manufacturing of food and drink, uh, low-carbon technologies and net zero, and business professional and financial services. And in that latter sec uh, uh, sector, we uh, invested heavily in Supertech West Midlands, which is a, an industry-led um, uh, group, and our investment has really turbo boosted the impact of that group. Since launching in 2021, Supertech has massively amplified the voice and the potential of regional businesses in fintech, insurtech, prop tech, and legal tech. And we've also really raised our, our region's profile in the national fintech arena. Anita said it, skills for employment is still a real priority for us, particularly because in this region we feel still fall short of the national UK average when it comes to the higher level skills that employers really need to create those high level and better quality jobs. So our Growth Hub Skills Service helps businesses understand and plan workforce development, do skills audits, um, create partnership, uh, apprenticeships. So far, the service has helped over 600 businesses and has helped almost 300 young people who are currently not in employment, education or training. And the work is helped by the £650,000 apprenticeship levy that we manage on behalf of Birmingham City Council to help local people gain an apprenticeship opportunity in local businesses. In parallel, we fund the Ladder for Greater Birmingham, which since it was launched in 2018 with GBS Lab support has created over 3,000 local apprenticeships. And of course, um, that's really important. It's good to note as well that many of those apprenticeships are higher level skills apprenticeships. We also support, you saw it in the video, programs like the Digital Innovators, which lets 16 to 19 year olds de develop their digital skills, but also become acquainted with industry and start considering a career that maybe previously they hadn't considered, where they can make a real impact and achieve real success without necessarily needing a university degree. Careers in cybersecurity, for example. Our role here isn't just about investment. We've also brought together charities and providers of services to young people to help them into employment, to foster collaboration, because collectively we can achieve greater in impact at a time when public funding undoubtedly will remain a challenge. And that's part of our commitment to young people. Our young people director on the board is in the, in the room today, and it's great you're here, Sophie. Uh, we made young people a, a specific priority for our organization because there's overwhelming evidence that the pandemic has particularly affected the younger people in our region and has exacerbated pre-existing inequalities. Our third strand is placemaking stimulating the creation of inclusive, attractive, sustainable spaces and developing a pipeline of investments. Anita already talked about Enterprise Zone and about the transformation of the city centre, and there's more. We're about to publish our report into fit-for-purpose workspaces in the region. It found that there is a shortage of dedicated local lab space for medtech companies to expand locally. We've already acted upon that finding by working with the University of Birmingham and the West Midlands Combined Authority, and we created Unit 9, a med tech lab that's located in Birmingham Research Park that opened its doors earlier this year and has been fully occupied ever since. Now, the Leveling Up White Paper promotes investing in locally-led community projects. GBS Lab has been doing that for years. We invested £367,000 
in um, developing and funding nine cultural action zones where local businesses, communities and cultural leaders come together to reanimate the neighbourhoods, to bring footfall back into the high streets, to reignite civic pride and stimulate community cohesion. Those cultural action zones have been a great success and there's real appetite for them to be further developed and funded because they fit so well with levelling up objectives and they can achieve so much with relatively modest investment. Anita mentioned our recycled grants and they're another great example of making our money go further. From 2010, GBS Lab has managed the Growing Places Fund, which was put in place to unlock local sites for housing and employment. We distributed part of this fund through loans and recycled grants, and that effectively means we invest the grants and when certain milestones are hit, the grants are paid back to be reinvested again and achieve yet more impact. This has helped us stretch the funds by more than 70% from the original 22 million to now 38 million. That recycled money has been used to fund projects like the Creative Content Hub in Digbeth, which provides 50,000 square foot of modern high quality office space aimed at broadcasters and content makers. This year, we also used that recycled fund to, for projects supporting young people and delivering clean growth. We funded 11 projects, and that includes, includes the Whole House Retrofit project in East Birmingham. It includes the Digital Youth Hub in North Solihull. And two of those 11 projects have already completed, the Redditch Construction Centre and the Tisley Incubator for Clean Energy. I could go on and on, but you probably get it by now. We are really very committed to delivering our mission of inclusive, sustainable growth. We also understand that times have changed and many of the functions and services that we developed and have delivered very successfully over time will next year transfer to others. We now work really hard to make sure that that wealth of learning and everything we know about what's worked so well and equally what's worked not so well will be passed on and shared with those who pick, pick up the baton from us. Uh, because it's so important, and others have said it, that that transition happens smoothly with as little disruption as possible. And that's why it's so important to us that we can continue our services for as long as we can. And that, that means that our businesses and communities are not left at a time when every bit counts. So just to reiterate, in case you've not paid attention so far, we are here to continue to work with you, our partners, and to support you, our local businesses, whilst we prepare for the transfer and integration of our functions. And as you will see this afternoon in our Better Your Business Showcase, we have a wealth of experience and services on offer. So I really want to encourage you to make the most of today and speak to our fabulous team about the many ways in which we can work with you. Thank you. Thank you, Hen. Now, as it is our AGM, open to the public, one of the things that we do have to do is um, open the floor to questions. Um, so we're going to have a quick panel session. Um, 10 minutes or so and if we have any unanswered questions then please do email them to us and we will publish them on our website or reply to you. So if I could invite back onto the stage Geeta, um, Anita, <laughs> that rhymes, um, Hen if you could come back on the stage and joining them is one of our non-exec board directors Sean Suku who is our lead for SMEs. I'm just making my promise. I'm coming for that samosa soup. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm doing thinking, that together. I, mean, I was thinking that we we were we actually went to the Alex Stadium one evening together, didn't we? And um, and didn't stop for a samosa. I don't know how yeah. that happened, but we will be there. We'll be there for the samosa <laughs> and the tie and the chat <laughs> as well. Um, okay. So moving on then. 
we've talked about this, and the December 23 date is really key for us to communicate today, but how important is it for businesses to have that seamless access to support, regardless of what's happening in the background in terms of transition of services to local authorities or the combined authority? And if I could get your perspective on this, um, Sean, perhaps, first of all, uh, as a business owner as well of, of Winnie's um, Kitchens, as seen on TV, Channel 4. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think now more than ever, especially with uh, rising uh, costs, uh, raw materials, uh, energy prices, etc., um, there couldn't be a more critical time. And as uh, Geeta uh, said so wonderfully with her case study, um, n continuity could not be more key. So I'm just really pleased to hear about that extension, the fact that we will be going to December 2023 uh, now, which is fantastic. Um, it's needed, and f the thought that it could even go with the amount of support that I've received personally, uh, it would be terrible. So fantastic that it continues. Uh, and our SMEs are feeding that back. We've got a live survey going on at the moment, which we will share with you after, after um, today, called um, It's Around the Cost of Running Your Business. Hen, as an exec team, you know, we, we feed back from, we get feedback from our businesses. We very much shape our offering around what businesses need. Um, can you maybe just give us a bit of light on some of the background um, conversations going on in terms of uh, ensuring we have this seamless continuity of business support? So, yes, of course. I think um, what's really clear to the partners who, as I referred to earlier, pick up the baton from us, and, and, and that's not just one partner, that's the combined authority in partnership with the local authorities, the growth company, and so on. It's, um, it's really important to us in, in the many conversations we have with them that the business feedback, the voice of business, and not just the voice of the strategic large employers, but actually the voice of, of smaller businesses that we work with, that make up the vast majority of the business community in this region is, is represented. And that we feed in our direct um, frontline experience of responding to crises as well, because at the moment it does feel we're kind of moving from one extraordinary situation to another. We've had the exit from the EU, we've had the pandemic, we've now got the cost of living crisis. Um, many of you in this room probably know that our response to the pandemic was particularly swift and well coordinated and really effective. Um, that's the, ki the kind of intelligence and uh, corporate memory and corporate learning that's really important to pass on. And for us, that, that's very much a priority. And there is a, uh, a reassurance in the fact that we will still be around till December 23 to continue to share that and shape the future. And Gita, I mean, you've spoken about this as a business owner. Uh, you were there during that COVID period receiving that business help, uh, you know, how important is it for businesses to feel, quite frankly, wanted and not abandoned at this moment in time? I think that's really key because um, ultimately it can be very lonely and particularly during COVID, people were working pretty much in silos unless you accessed a network. And I think the real um, challenge as a small business owner, um, businesses of any size really, but certainly as a small business owner, it was how do you remain connected um, to everything that's going on and, and that it's important to be in touch with that's relevant to you at that point in time. And I think keeping those conversations, those open lines of communication and being in touch with workshops and strategic moves really makes you more relevant. I mean, we um, expanded our catering arm to make sure that the offset of us not going to events and shows um, meant that we could bring in some more cash flow. But it needed to have been a fully fleshed conversation to be able to enable that. So, you know, um, if you don't have conversations, you really don't... Sh um, I suppose, unravel alternative ways of working. Um, and resilience is all about finding alternative ways to be able to enable your business to thrive. And it can thrive, it's just about being a little bit more, you know, pivoting, I suppose, is the word, um, to, to be that resilient. And that, that all happens with collaboration. That's exactly what our programme during COVID was mm. called, called one of the programmes, our £1.7 million Pivot and Prosper mm. programme. <laughs> um, we've had a question around, Anita, if I could... Um, if I could ask you about this around our policy work um, what happens to that when integration and transition into the combined authority or local councils happens over the the next financial year 
the, the policy work, um, the, the policies we've laid out and have been working to, we're hoping that in conversations that we're having with the city council and with the combined authority and others, that that will continue. Obviously, it's going to change. You know, the policies will, are, are not going to stand still. We're hoping that there will be great input from businesses, from the academic world. Um, and when I say businesses, uh, and I keep on reinforcing this, small businesses as well as large businesses, to see what are the policies that the local government, um, uh, our, our local councils, and the combined authority will develop. Some of it is going to be dictated by the white paper and what's coming in that and the levelling up agenda and whether there's going to be any money available, etc. But our policies are still there. We'll carry on working to them. I've, uh, I've had a commitment from uh, the mayor, um, the, the, the voice of, of business, which we've been you know, banging on about for such a long time, will be heard, and the, particularly the voice of SMEs will not be forgotten. Um, other, other policies, wider policies, so you take the work that we've done around supporting young people, mental health, we're hoping that there'll be a joined up approach. So we know the combined authority's been doing some work on, on mental health. We hope that that threads into the work that we've been doing with young people and supporting young people. I really hope out of all of this chaos and, and uh, change, we can come up with policies and strategies and then business plans that make sense to our business community, to our young people who've got to navigate their way through that, and that they really do provide what the city and the region needs, which is growth, uh, but, but growth that is supported and growth that supports a wider range of communities. So we do want to reassure you through our excellent um, board of directors who come from the private sector and the public sector and education sector, we are collectively making that case to um, whichever home our services find themselves in and to ensure that there is a voice for business at the table and in particular our small and medium sized enterprises that make up well, nearly 90% of our economy, so the backbone of our economy, um, essentially as well. And also there's a question around geography that's come in, and I'm going to open up to the floor after this one. We currently serve, I did my exam question, much like I did when I, I was recruited, the nine um, local authority areas, which is quite a vast region, you know, right from Bertrand on Drent um, to the Wire Far East and everything in between. What happens to that region then, um, post, once all of our services have been transferred over by March 20, March 24. We don't have a blueprint on this one at the moment. I mean, some of those local authorities will choose where they sit, um, and that's work in progress. So I think that's really some, something the politicians need to get their heads around. But we know that w wherever they sit, there, is, there will be opportunities. So, for example, as we carry on till December next year, um, those local authorities will carry on working with us as much as they can, but they may want to work with other areas. Now, remember, all LEPs aren't going to transfer into local authorities straight away because we, the government still has to make wait for county deals to be done where there aren't combined authorities. Um, the whole rationale for government is that um, the LEP functions need to sit within elected bodies, and in some places there aren't combined authorities and there aren't mayors. So there is, it's the, if you take the national picture, it's going to be quite some time before the whole of the LEP structure moves into those, com uh, those elected uh, or combined authorities or, or county mayors, or whatever it's going to be. So it isn't not, the, the LEP structure, uh, the network, isn't going to disappear anytime soon across the country. But here we are going yeah. to see... Um, uh, the We're one of the first. Change. We are one of the Leading the way, as always, GBS <laughs> LEP, um, albeit in a way that perhaps, yes, is arguably um, uncertain at times. But as I said, we are ensuring as an executive and a board of directors that that transition is made in a very orderly fashion. So there is that seamless continuity of service. I'd like to open up um, questions to our uh, delegates, our audience, um, our, our family of of, and communities and businesses, at any questions, first of all? And there's a, there's well, a gentleman then. We've got a mic coming round. Parv is... Um, and while, while the mic's going, can I just say we have got fantastic board members here, so... Actually, board can members, our board members free. stand up, please? Because our can board we, members, we have give Louise, up. Mike, David, Ian, you too, Sophie. Yeah. We've got um, Matt, Councillor Dorma from Redditch there. And... Hi, <laughs> Councillor Jones. Rinsel as is well. In the room? Anybody else in the room? Have missed that? Councillor Jones. Councillor Jones, is she still here? Oh, um, hello. Just to Thank say you. that our board members, 
give up their time and their expertise and their professionalism to really shape the way we work and the way we deliver. And we are indebted to them for the time that they do give to us, and that's why we have managed to deliver in such a successful way for over a decade. So thank you very much to all of you for, for giving your expertise. And I certainly, on a really personal level, every time I go to a, a pillar board meeting or a board meeting, come away with a new learning. So thank you. Um, gentleman in the blue suit. Yeah, thank you, Mike Leonard. Um, I just wondered, um, you mentioned that the skills agenda is um, going into Birmingham City Council. Um, uh, I wonder how that fits with the areas that are not within the GSB lab that are not Birmingham. So you know, the areas who's going to pick that up. And, and secondly, just to say um, a big thank you to our British GSB lab for the work you've done so far. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we well, want I, to try I'm, and answer that if question? We can the moment, but I'm also wondering if we get to our councillor, who's also a councillor Dormant, who's also a board member, to comment on what's going to happen outside off the Birmingham area. For, sorry, don't want to put you in. So let me just go to Hen first, and then if we can get a mic to, uh, to um, Councillor Dorma, and then he could perhaps answer that question as well. So Hen, from a skills perspective, what happens to yeah. skills everywhere else other than our, our, our sort of geographical Birmingham area? Thank you, Mike. The uh, integration of the skills service is not something that, uh, for which there's a, a blueprint yet, a bit like the, the previous question. And that's partly because the government's guidance around the LEP functions that are integrating doesn't reference skills. Mm. Um, we know our take on skills has been very much skills for employers, uh, sorry, skills for employment, skills that businesses need, which is, which is a particular take. Um, and um, at the moment, we're, we're working with people like the Combined Authority to make sure that the, the, the types of activity that we support around apprenticeships, but also around things like I mentioned, digital innovators and so on, is, is uh, the profile of that is, is raised because it doesn't necessarily always fit, uh, fit very neatly in the definitions and, and the approaches of skills in, in, uh, at a regional level and in, indeed the local level. Now, with the disappearance of the European funding from the end of next year, um, I think there is a question mark around w w what happens to some of this skills activity. I mentioned in my speech that we convened a group of charities and providers and part of that is because it's quite clear public funding is going to be um, harder to, to obtain. Certainly our pockets aren't as deep as they once were. So it's even more important that we get people to collaborate and learn from, from each other and, and achieve the greatest impact. But it's definitely an area where um, we're, we're not currently reassured that there's a very clear route to continuity. So we've got Councillor Dormer, who's the leader of Redditch Borough Council and also one of our board directors. What happens then to um, skills service your way? Okay, so, so what we're doing at Redditch, we've set up a leaders board, um, so it's uh, business leaders. Um, and their, their focus and their, their sole goal is about skills within our town. Um, so we're engaging with the local uh, providers, but we we're tapping in to younger schools, to uh, primary schools, middle schools, so that we get them, get children at an age to, to have, a, 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 I guess, a, a better idea of what they want to aspire to be. Um, aspiration is another issue, mm -hmm. I do believe, uh, especially in the town where we're at. Um, so, yeah, we're working with the schools. Uh, we're setting up like very similar days to um, what, you, what you spoke about earlier. Um, setting uh, challenges within the school and then we're helping them complete the challenges to, to try and to, to drive the aspiration basically and to um to try and give them an idea and to um to, we're doing mentoring as well business mentoring i also do um mock interviews with them just everything to put them on the right path and to um to give them the best chance that they can to get a decent job really so, this, so what, what I'm getting is that you are very much looking at um, perhaps some of the support you may have received through the skills service yep. at the LEP. Now, your pipeline of activity is very much localised services, yep. which yep. I think we will expect from other 
uh, other local authorities, but, but also perhaps reaching out to your growth hubs that you have the Worcestershire let there as well. Well, uh, to, to be really honest, I signpost a lot of people to the Birmingham Growth Hub. Uh, <laughs> uh, our train tends to only go one way, so um, it's always easier to get here, isn't it? Um, Thank you. But, yeah. Thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you. Any other questions from the floor? Maybe a final one, because we are now running um, well over, and we've got, um, we've got our Michelin star chef waiting in the wings somewhere probably throwing his pots and pans around because uh, he should be on stage in about three minutes. We've got um, a question here on the front row from this gentleman. You'll put it online, okay. Do make sure that you share it with us. It's pressoffice at gbsslep.co.uk or just grab one of us uh, members of staff today and we'll note it down and get an answer to you. Any other questions? Maybe one final one, anybody? Any hands up? No? Um, thank you very much. If you do have any questions, like I said, please do email them to us, pressoffice at gbslep.co.uk. Uh, thank you so much for coming along and sparing your time for us. We did have to rush it a little bit, I know, this morning, um, but we are overrunning. I do just want to leave, um, leave on a, a note or perhaps a, a word or two from you, Sean, because you are our board director, you do represent SMEs, and as we've said today, our services will continue until December 23. So with that dual hat on of board director and business owner, just once again, um, if you could just summarise the difference that the LEP has made to you before you became a board director, but then as a board director, how incumbent it is upon you to ensure that we do carry on with our service? Yeah, for me, um, the LEP has been just a huge help uh, whenever. So I started my work with uh, my journey with first Sandra and then Craig. Um, whenever I have something going on, whenever I need to pivot my business, whenever there's been some form of change, there's been that, that person at the end of the phone really just to sound out, just to uh, get some advice from and point us in the right direction. So obviously Gita um, very, uh, very well put it earlier, but um, we do need uh, more people to actually come forward and actually share your experiences as well. We do have a survey uh, currently up um, about, and it's live about, the cost of running your business. Now, um, the, the more input we can get from that, the more we can actually shape the support that we're actually able to give you. Um, and because of that, that and that's just the nature of the LEP. That is how the LEP can actually pivot in its support as well. Um, but just from some of the uh, responses that we've had so far, in fact, well, I'll, I'll read some of them off, actually. Ah, oh, there we go. So, um, the current climate has led businesses to increase cost of their products, but also delay purchasing new equipment, followed by plans to, um, and actually hold off uh, expanding premises. So, that's one thing. 50% um, of respondents are not recruiting. Uh, that's another thing. Um, but also lack of cons uh, consumer confidence and increased fuel costs and rising energy prices are top concerns as well as rising costs of raw materials. Now, um, for me personally as a business owner, um, that last piece is the kind of biggest thing for me. Uh, it's the raw material uh, aspect of it. It's the rising uh, fuel costs. Um, just across two of my co uh, companies, I also uh, re recruit over just, just over 100 people and beyond those numbers are, I feel responsible for those 100 people, and those people are all going through their own personal challenges as well. So now more so than ever, that kind of business support is really, really, really important. So after the conference, we will share the link where you can uh, kind of feed back into that survey so we can try and give the best possible uh, support that we can. Thank you. Sean, thank you very much. Thank you to all of you for listening attentively and being patient with our slightly overrunning, um, uh, overrunning morning, but um, much appreciated. If you are staying on for our Better Your Business show, we'll be getting underway within the next five minutes. There are a couple of forms we would like you to fill in if you are a business here. The important one is the SME enrolment form because that really helps us claim back the hours and, crucially, the funding from the European Union. And there is also a feedback form which, again, 
is really important for us because we're very agile and flexible in the way we work and we would like to shape our services so that they are tangible and relevant and make a difference to you. And on that note, thank you very much. Um, if you are staying with us, I do hope you enjoy your day. If you're not, then please have a safe journey to your workplaces, to your homes, wherever you are returning. Thank you very much. Thank you.